Welcome to the Human Health Campus Pediatric Nuclear Medicine Webinar Series. This webinar is entitled Thyroid Scintigraphy in Children and is presented by Claire de la Priole Filet from the Department of Pediatric Nuclear Medicine at the Trousseau Hospital in Paris. I am pleased to present this seminar to you on behalf of the Nuclear Medicine and Diagnostic Imaging Section of the International Atomic Energy Agency in collaboration with the European Association of Nuclear Medicine. Dear colleagues, the Pediatric Department of the Public Assistance of the Hospital Trousseau performs around 75 pediatric thyroid scintigraphies per year. We hope that this presentation will help to inform and prepare you for this very interesting test. Most of you have a routine practice of adult thyroid scintigraphy whose most frequent indication is hyperthyroidism. However, most of the children admitted are admitted due to congenital hypothyroidism or other pathologies such as cervical and thyroid nodules, which are less frequent. First, we will look at congenital hypothyroidism. It's considered an unusual pathology with an incidence of about 1 out of 3,000 newborns, but it is the most common endocrine disorder in children. Screening newborns has been a great success because early treatment allows for normal growth and mental development of the child. The earlier the treatment starts, the better the prognosis. The guideline published in 2014 by the European Society of Pediatric Endocrinology recommends performing both ultrasounds and scintigraphy. It is mandatory to do the scintigraphy during the first week of treatment, since the uptake of iodine is strongly related with the level of TSH. This level rapidly decreases when the baby is treated with thyroxin. The scintigraphy plays an important role. In most cases, it provides a diagnosis and gives the family visual evidence that the baby has a lifelong disorder. For pediatric endocrinologists, it identifies the most fragile patients, those with the absence of a thyroid or complete organification defect. The scintigraphy results also influence the genetic counseling for future siblings and the choice of targets for genetic studies. The methodology is simple. A small activity of iodine-123 or technetium-99 metastable is intravenously injected. To avoid pain, we use glucose sucking. The first acquisition is a 600 second image done around one hour after the administration of the radiopharmaceutical. A low energy, high resolution collimator is used. The baby is positioned on a special newborn pillow as shown in the picture on the right. The anterior field of view includes the head and the trunk. Further acquisitions are functions of the first results. A pinhole magnification may be useful. The normal position of the thyroid gland is at the anterior part of the neck just above the sternal notch. In this case, we'll speak about an ectopic thyroid. As can be observed, the salivary activity is lower with iodine-123 than with technetium-99M. This slide shows a scintigraphic image of an ectopic thyroid gland with the presence of thyroid tissue located at the base of the tongue, which is the most frequent. It may also be located lower at the upper part or the middle part of the neck. In these cases, a lateral view is helpful to confirm diagnosis. If there is no visualization of thyroid tissue one hour after injection, it is mandatory to do a second acquisition about three hours post-injection to confirm that there is no thyroid tissue present. In this case, the result is athyriosis. 
The presence of a small stomach activity eliminates a rare cause of congenital hypothyroidism, which is the absence of NIS, or sodium iodine symporter. When technetium 99M is used, the interpretation of the result will be the same. A much less frequent cause of congenital hypothyroidism is hypoplasia of the thyroid gland. A pinhole acquisition may be useful to better examine the shape of the thyroid, which is only possible while the baby is sleeping. These are the results of a retrospective review done in the department, which includes a total of 182 consecutive scintigraphies in patients with congenital hypothyroidism. Ectopy was found in 35% of patients, atheriosis in 21% of patients, and hypoplasia in 1% of patients. 43% of these patients had a utopic thyroid. When the thyroid is utopic, congenital hypothyroidism may be related to a dishormonogenesis, specifically an organification defect. This means that iodine may enter the thyroid cell, but it cannot be organified or may only be partially organified. Therefore, the physiological accumulation of iodine in the colloid is impaired. This process can be explored by a perchlorate discharge test, but it is limited to the injection of iodine-123 isotope as technetium-99 is indeed not organified. This quantitative test is based on the comparison of the thyroid activity before and one hour after oral administration of 90 mg of perchlorate. Perchlorate can discharge iodine from the thyroid cell, but not from the colloid. A normal result corresponds to an increase, stability, or a mild decrease of thyroid activity, less than 10%, one hour after perchlorate administration. This is an illustrative example of a normal test result. We see an increase in the thyroid region of interest, or ROI, activity after the administration of perchlorate resulting in 4,822 instead of 4,550 pre-perchlorate. A pathological result corresponds to a decrease of more than 10% that may be quite complete, as it is the case for this baby. The post-perchlorate acquisition on the right shows a complete discharge of iodine from the thyroid. Below is an example calculation. For both acquisitions, it is necessary to measure the activity in the thyroid ROI minus the background ROI. This is called the true thyroid activity. Variation in thyroid activity is the difference between the thyroid activity before perchlorate and the thyroid activity after perchlorate, divided by the result of the activity before perchlorate. In this example, there is a decrease of 76% after perchlorate administration. The test is positive, therefore, there is an organification defect. What should be the effective dose for a newborn thyroid scintigraphy? About 3.3 millisieverts utilizing iodine-123 and a little less using technetium-99M. But the usage of 99M technetium excludes the possibility to perform the perchlorate test at the same time. In our experience, it occurs in 43% of the babies with congenital hypothyroidism. This is the reason for the exclusive use of iodine-123 in France, although it is more expensive. The important message of this first part is the necessity to perform the thyroid scintigraphy in the first week of L-thyroxine treatment. 
Now we will discuss other pediatric pathologies requiring thyroid scintigraphy. These are thyroglossal cyst and thyroid nodules. When a child is referred to an endocrinologist or a surgeon for a cervical nodule on the midline of the neck, it is possible that the child is experiencing a thyroglossal tract cyst. The aim of the scintigraphy is to avoid ablation of an ectopic thyroid, which may not have been previously identified as it is large enough to ensure a normal hormonal production. Both technetium 99M and iodine-123 can be used, as the only diagnostic question is if there is any uptake of the isotope in the nodule. Here is an example of a cervical nodule, which is just above a normal thyroid. This image shows two cervical masses with no evidence of a thyroid gland in the normal localization. The small upper mass is at the base of the tongue. The other is larger and corresponds to the palpable cervical nodule. Therefore, the surgery must be delayed till the end of growth. Thyroid nodules are much less frequent in children than in adults, however the methodology is the same. The essential question is to identify if it is a cold nodule in order to decide if a biopsy is required. A few bibliographic references can be useful. We underline especially the first two. In case one, a three-year-old boy with congenital hypothyroidism is referred for his first scintigraphy. Probably too sick to be explored immediately after birth, he was treated without any exploration. The treatment was stopped three weeks before the exam. Here the interior view can be observed with a line mark on the sternal notch. What would be your diagnosis? The thyroid tissue is in the right place, but the right lobe is absent. It is a right lobe agenesia. When the thyroid scintigraphy cannot be performed at the beginning of the treatment, it is postponed to the age of three, when it is possible to pause the treatment for a short period. Case 2 presents a young 12-year-old girl with clinical and biological signs of hyperthyroidism. Ultrasounds show an enlarged thyroid without nodules. Here are four statements, but only one is correct. The correct answer is the scintigraphy is not indicated. It is not indicated as the diagnosis of Graves' disease does not require thyroid scintigraphy and there is no thyroid nodule. Graves' disease occurs mainly in adolescence and the thyroid scintigraphy is done only when ultrasounds show nodules or after progression and medication escape or for the planning of therapy with iodine-131. Case 3 presents a newborn girl with very high TSH levels. Examine the anterior view taken three hours post-injection. What would be your conclusion? There is no iodine uptake in the neck or in the mouth, so this is the scintigraphic image of an atheriosis. Be aware that if the scintigraphy is done more than seven days after the beginning of the treatment, the scintigraphic image may be exactly the same as in atheriosis, but ultrasound can confirm that there is a thyroid gland in situ. This is the main reason for the combination of ultrasound and scintigraphy. They can correct each other. Ultrasound is less sensitive than scintigraphy for small ectopies, but the advantage is that it will not be influenced by the treatment.
In case 4, the intravenous injection is impossible to perform. What do you propose is the solution? It is still possible to perform the scintigraphy. Iodine-123 may be given orally, even if the contamination risk is higher, but the first acquisition may be delayed. This is an anterior view two hours after oral administration of iodine-123. A small sublingual ectopy is slightly visible, which could have been masked by the salivary activity. Wait longer if possible, as it is easier to make conclusions with a late point acquisition. This one has been done the day after. Now a perchlorate test has to be performed. Have a look at the quantitative data and try to calculate. What is your conclusion? It is quite simple. The variation of thyroid activity is high, so the discharge test is positive. It must not be forgotten that for a precise comparison, the data needs to be acquired from exactly the same geometrical conditions. Therefore, planar acquisitions are preferable. All ROI must have exactly the same size. The background is positioned on the right lung to be as far away as possible from the gastric activity. If the result is doubtful, that is 8 to 12 percent decrease, redo the calculation or ask a colleague to independently calculate the results. I hope that this presentation will be of great help for you. Thank you for your attention.